going to epilepsy here, you know, it's a, it's a common theme in all of neuromodulation or deep brain stimulation and functional neurosurgery in general that um, it is underutilized on a vast scale. Uh, this is just a graphic of uh, epilepsy. You can see that out of 2.9 million people in the United States, uh, about 4,000 end up going for neuromodulation per year. Uh, 3,000 to surgery, and that really comprises about 1 to 2 percent of drug-resistant epilepsy patients each year who end up getting treatment. So that's really, really tiny subset. Um, so once you've decided that somebody is drug resistant, uh, there are a number of different options. You know, you can kind of do nothing or you can do diet, uh, ketogenic or Atkins, modified Atkins. You can go to open resection op or disconnection surgery, or you can go to neuromodulation. And, um, you know, the VNS has been around for a while, since about 97. The responsive neurostimulation is kind of what I'll focus on today. That's been around since 2013. And then deep brain stimulation is actually available in Europe, uh, not yet available here in the United States for epilepsy, but uh, my guess is in the next year or two that will change as well. Their, their uh, Medtronic is putting into the FDA now for approval and will uh, hopefully get it. So uh, I think most people are familiar with vagus nerve stimulation. Um, it's available since 97 for patients 12 or older. It's used in patients with epilepsy of all ages, um, and there's good literature that it works in all ages. Uh, but uh, up until recently, it has not been a uh, responsive stimulation uh, device. It's essentially a uh, open loop device that stimulates based on time not based on any feedback from the patient. Uh, they've changed that now with uh, two of their models. One is the 106. The other is now brand new called the Centivo, the 1000. Both of, the, both of these have what's called an auto stim feature. And basically, it, it can detect cardiac uh, heart rate. And it can compare a change in a short time frame to uh, a baseline and then give an additional stimulation that you can define based on some you know, threshold that it's met in terms of increased heart rate. So the, the, the idea is that when somebody's having a seizure, they might be tachycardic, and then you can give them an extra stimulation at the onset of the seizure. Um, when you kind of look at the major study that they did to get it approved, uh, there was two trials, one in the United States, one in Europe, and the combined data from the two showed a, about a, after a one-year um, outcome of 38% uh, responder rate. So 38% of the patients have it had a 50% or better reduction in their seizures. Um, that's actually not quite as good as their regular device that has been looked at in, in many studies. And I think it's really that uh, it wasn't a big enough study, it wasn't long enough term outcome. It's pretty clear that as people progress with VNS, they tend to improve over multi-year time frame. I don't think that there's any evidence that the auto stim does anything additionally at this point in time, but it certainly is intellectually appealing. Um, there are people for whom, you know, they can't, uh, as you may know, people can do a, a manual magnet swipe to activate the device as well. But uh, if they have nocturnal seizures, um, you know, if there's nobody around that can swipe them and they don't know when their seizures are starting, uh, that's very difficult. So we here now use this uh, for people who, you know, are often alone, uh, have generalized seizures, nocturnal seizures. If they're at high risk for SUDEP, which is sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, um, we are paying more attention now when we're doing monitoring uh, of patients with video EEG as to whether or not they have tachycardia at the ictal onset. Um, and uh, for pediatric patients, they're just poor options in general, so we want to kind of give them every, every benefit uh, we possibly can. Um, it is uh, a little bit more expensive than, than the older versions, uh, but and at our art institution, we, we only use it in a very small subset of the people that we would uh, place VNS into. So that's responsive neurostimulation for VNS. Um, and now I'm going to focus the rest on basically what's called the NeuroPACE device or responsive neurostimulator. Um, it is approved by the FDA to treat patients that are 18 or older. 
and you can treat up to one or two foci. Basically, you can implant two electrodes and connect it to the device. And so uh, if you are, have good knowledge of where their seizures are coming from and they have either one or two onset zones, you can use this device. And it essentially uh, consists of a, a pulse generator that's implanted in the skull and then you have either a depth electrode or strip electrode that you can place pretty much anywhere in the brain. You can use two depths, two strips, strip and depth. Uh, oftentimes people will actually implant additional electrodes even though they can't be hooked up just so that if they if one electrode doesn't have a good uh, ictal onset detection you can switch out to another electrode with a fairly minor surgery not have to go intracranial again uh, practically though we we hardly ever uh, do that so um, basically this is a the first closed loop brain stimulator where it's after it's implanted, it just in the background detects seizure activity or basically electrocorticography. Once the corticography meets some threshold that you've defined as a detection, then it will stimulate. And after the stimulation is done, it will go back and monitor again. And it basically goes through this cycle of monitoring, detection, stimulation, monitoring. Uh, for any given seizure, it can stimulate up to five times, and then if it hasn't stopped the seizure by that time, then it waits till that seizure has ended and then reactivates those five potential therapies. And the, the goal of that is to basically prevent somebody from going into continuous stimulation if a detection thinks it's always in a seizure. Um, so here's an example. I don't know if we have the pointer. Um, well, anyway, so here's here we can record up to four channels of activity. Um, here we have one channel where we've seen a, a onset of a seizure. We've set the detector and it's picked up the seizure right here. We don't have simulation turned on with this one, so this is just an example of what it looks like when a detector has been built. Um, here's an example of how we can change the detectors. You can have different patterns to detect, different channels to detect off of. Um, you can look for spiking activity. You can look for a certain frequency ranges. You can set it at power levels to activate. You can combine different detections so you won't stimulate in like, unless two different detectors go, go off. So it's very flexible in how you can set it. It's, it's somewhat confusing to set and it, it takes a lot of um, kind of uh, experience before you can get good at this. Most of the time, epilepsy centers have the epileptologist doing uh, a lot of the programming. It's also a very uh, nice device for saving uh, information. So the device itself can can uh, save up to about four seizures worth of data, and then it can also save a lot of uh, counters. So it can save how many times the detectors have gone off per day, uh, per month, uh, how many times stimulation has happened, how many times uh, people can like swipe with a magnet to mark an event. Um, all of this can be logged and then followed very uh, nicely over time. The stimulation itself is also very flexible. Each of the contacts of the electrodes, you, you can have basically two bursts with, uh, with any given treatment and you can set all of the contacts as either anodes or cathodes. Uh, you can set the CAN as a uh, anode, and uh, so it's very flexible. You can just stimulate all of the electrodes. Uh, you can stimulate just selective electrodes. Practically speaking, most of the time, we stimulate all of the available electrodes with any uh, given therapy. And so here's an example of on the top, you have a patient where the detectors have been turned on, but stimulation has not been turned on. So you have the detection happening with, yeah, oh, thank you very much. So you have uh, the detection here uh, after a little chirp, uh, but up here the, the stimulation has not been turned on yet, so the, the seizure goes on. This is uh, the one second markers here. And then after the stimulation is turned on, you can see detection happens here. This blank uh, sort of flat line is when the stimulation is being given. It then redetects and it sees still a couple spikes, so it delivers another stimulation, redetects again, still thinks there's something abnormal, stimulates again, 
finally redetects and doesn't see any seizure activity, so it's stop stimulated. And then the programmer itself um, has, uh, the, that we have access to, we can basically look at battery life, uh, impedances, uh, you can look at uh, saved electrocorticography that has happened over time. Patients can download from their device to a laptop at home and then upload from the laptop to the servers so we can actually see electrocorticography the same day that they've had an event at home afterwards. Um, we can interrogate their device, change their settings, and keep a library. We can also just put a, a wand over and look at live electrocorticography, and frequently we do that when we're doing test stimulation. So before we send somebody home, we want to make sure that that stimulation level that we're giving them is not causing symptoms, side effects, and so we'll test that live and then lock in the settings and send them home afterwards. Uh, the procedure itself, or it basically is in kind of five steps. We uh, pretty much always place the leads first, and this is very different from deep brain stimulation because, you know, we don't have three targets. We have infinite number of targets. Wherever we decide the seizures are coming from is where we want to place these electrodes, and a lot, a lot of times that's based on uh, electrocorticography and, and sub dural grid monitoring or stereo EEG monitoring, and I would say, you know, mesial temporal lobe accounts for about 50% of the implants that we do, uh, but the other 50% are all over the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and lateral temporal area or combination of different uh, lobes. Uh, then we do the craniectomy to place the device in the skull. Uh, place it in the tray that we first placed, connect the leads up, and then test the whole system to make sure it's working. Um, important thing is for incision planning. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, so for, for the neurostimulator location, uh, you know, you, again, you can place it anywhere in the skull, but you have to think about, um, uh, one, how they're going to do afterwards, and two, how you can come back at a later time and replace the battery. So generally, we don't want to uh, put it underneath the temporalis muscle because it hurts more, and it's very difficult to come back on a regular basis to replace them. They've pretty much engineered the, the curvature of the device to fit the curvature of the parietal bone. So we try to do that as much as possible. Play, I usually place it on the non-dominant parietal skull, um, but you know, if, there's a, if they've already had surgery there or, or some other reason, we might think of moving it to another location. Um, we uh, generally try to uh, position the stimulator so that as the leads come off the stimulator, they're not going to go through or underneath the incision because one of the biggest risks coming back and replacing the battery is that you might injure the lead in the process. And so you can see here in this next picture, you know, generally we make a U incision to place the first device and then set it up so that we can set, have a, a half of that incision opened up to, re to replace the battery at a subsequent revision. As I was saying, there are uh, both strips and depths. Uh, for the strips, you can, they're all 10 millimeter spacing between each contact, uh, but there are different lengths of these. You can get 15, 25, and 35, and it's good to plan out where your electrodes are gonna be in relation to where the device is to know what size uh, lead you're gonna wanna use for any given case. For the depth electrodes, there are two different intercontact spacings. One is a 10 millimeter, uh, that's commonly used in mesial temporal lobe. Uh, 3.5 millimeter spacing might be used in a cortical dysplasia or something where the, the target is more compact. Uh, and then they have two different sized uh, leads. If, if you're gonna be placing a depth electrode using a uh, frame with a uh, micro positioning device, then you're gonna probably wanna use the longer one uh, because the uh, the micro drive that we use for DBS uh, would not work with the 30 centimeter size. It isn't long enough to come up through the top of the micro positioning device. So we pretty much always use the 44 centimeter if we're going to use a frame with uh, the micro manipulator. Uh, these depth leads are uh, about the same uh, diameter as a DBS uh, lead. 
Uh, you have to make sure that your cannula is uh, going to be an appropriate length so that you're not going to shoot past the target with the cannula. Um, and uh, as I said, you have to use the 44 centimeter if you're going to use the uh, uh, micro manipulator. Um, then they also have a burr hole cover. We always use a uh, perforator, or I do anyway, uh, use a perforator bit, put in the burr hole cover, and use that to lock the uh, electrode into place. Um, for the craniectomy, they have a template that you can basically place over the scalp to play in your skin incision, and then place over the bone to outline uh, the uh, uh, template and then typically I do a craniectomy using like a four millimeter bit uh, round bit and then a router to complete the craniotomy craniectomy oftentimes you have to kind of uh, uh, do a little adjustment of the edges to make sure that this tray or what we call ferrule fits into place we don't want to have a huge gap so that people will notice it uh, and generally we want to offset this uh, a little bit deeper than you'd think the edge of this tray is about three millimeters below the edge of the device once it's in place so you want to sink down this uh, tray a little bit lower uh, in order to make sure that the device once it's in is flush with the rest of the skull and we can go over this in the uh, lab uh, a little bit in a little bit more detail uh, then you place the rns into the tray and then you can lock it in place with this little locking screw right here uh, you then connect the leads there are little markers on the leads to tell you when it's enough into the uh, device that you're going to make good contact with all of the uh, electrode contacts um, and then you connect the leads there's a little you have to screw down this cap uh, with a torque wrench and again make sure that the connector covers on and that you have a good pathway uh, that's not going through an incision line to get to the intracranial uh, area and you can see here we have a, a, a strip in the subtemporal region in this patient uh, in this drawing with a depth electrode in the hippocampus um, again, routing, routing considerations, you want, basically don't, you want to keep it as safe as possible for future revisions. If you are going to put in any extra electrodes that you're not going to utilize right away, you want to put a cap on those uh, so that they're electrically isolated. And then also, typically when we put the electrodes into the device, we want to mark uh, each electrode with a suture or something else to make sure when you come back later, you know which electrode is going to which location in the brain. So it's a good thing to either take pictures or mark your leads with uh, sutures or some way to remember. In terms of placing these electrodes, you know, strip electrodes we're often placing uh, with frameless navigation, with stealth or brain lab guidance. You're, you're coming back to a place that you've already uh, had a grid previously and you've marked on your stealth and so you can just use stealth to go back to the same location. Uh, if you're placing a depth electrode into like the hippocampus, um, generally we try to use uh, frame-based approaches. Uh, a lot of centers use the ROSA uh, robot or Nurmate. Uh, um, and then we, many centers also use either the Vario Guide uh, or the Vertec Arm. The, the major point is that you're going to get at least two millimeters accuracy, and it also kind of depends on where your target is. You know, if you're going to the hippocampal target, um, I want to make sure I'm going to have a two millimeter accuracy or better. If you're going to go to into the middle of a kind of a big dysplasia, uh, maybe, you know, that is not as critical. You might use a Vario Guide as opposed to a frame in that circumstance circumstance and you have to think if you're going to use both a strip and a depth electrode you might want to have that navigation for the strip and then use the vario guide for the depth as opposed to using a frame which will only be good for the depth and not necessarily good for uh, placing the strip so the key is to think about it ahead of time know which one which electrodes you're going to use and then design your operative uh, you know environment to make sure that you can be successful in your uh, plan uh, so looking at the evidence for efficacy for Neuropace, this is all based on uh, two major trials. There was a feasibility trial, then followed by a pivotal trial. 
All of those patients with both the trials were then uh, enrolled in a seven-year follow-up trial. And then after approval by the FDA, they had a post-approval study, which included uh, uh, 300. It's still not finished, actually, uh, up to 300 patients with 30 centers. But most of the data that I'm going to talk about is from basically these two and then this combined trial. Um, in the, there was a blinded portion of the trial in the first three months uh, after implantation and training. Uh, during that kind of blinded phase, there was a statistically uh, better outcome in patients who had it turned on than turned off. And then after three months, everybody was put into the open label phase, and most of the data that we're looking at today is from the open label phase. Uh, because it's it's getting to be much longer term outcome. Uh, as you can see here, uh, over the first couple of years after implantation, the response rate tends to go up. So this is the mean uh, seizure reduction. So uh, by how much your what percentage your seizures go down after turning the device on, we also look at responder rate, which is the percentage of patients who have a 50% improvement in their seizures or better. Those median versus responder rate tend to be fairly similar. Uh, that's at about 66% now, uh, and we're as far as eight years out now. But the VNS literature is actually fairly similar where uh, there's an improved response rate um, as the years increase after implantation which is in fact much better than uh, most medications where you can see there's often a beneficial effect for three months followed by some tapering off of that effect. Um, it's good to remember though that these are really the neuropace, the responsive neurostimulation is a palliative procedure. If we think we can cure their seizures with a resection, uh, either doing open surgery or laser ablation, we're going to go that route. Um, this is most often used in patients who have seizure foci in very eloquent areas that we can't resect or bitemporal epilepsy patients where we know we're not going to be able to resect uh, both of their hippocampi. Um, but within the data that we have, we can see that about 37% have had three months or longer seizure-free, and 13% have had one year or longer seizure-free. And we have a number of patients who have been seizure-free for many years now after implantation. A um, number of studies have kind of looked at subpopulations of, of RNS patients that have been implanted. Um, we've looked at uh, basically mesial onset versus neocortical onset. You can see there is a little bit of a difference in the outcomes of these patients. We have a 70% seizure reduction in the mesial temporal lobe patient set, whereas we have almost 60% uh, median reduction in the neocortical. Similarly, the responder rate is a little bit better uh, in mesial temporal versus neocortical. Uh, it's interesting that looking at the outcome, the functional outcomes in these patients, we really don't notice any decline in functional outcome at all. Um, and in fact, we see improvements in, in most of the patients. Uh, you can see that in patients who have mesial temporal lobe, either strips or, or depths, they have an improvement in memory um, up to a year out. And then for neocortical placements, we see improvements in naming uh, in those patients, which kind of functionally makes sense. That's kind of what we'd expect if it was going to improve function. Um, Looking at quality of life measures uh, with cognitive, mental health, physical health, and quality of life uh, in epilepsy patients, uh, quality 89, we all see statistical, uh, statistically significant improvements uh, from baseline during the uh, pivotal study. Um, we've now looked at the rate of SUDEP in patients with the RNS device. So again, this is sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. The rate of uh, SUDEP in this surgical cohort, which is kind of the worst of the worst patients with epilepsy who were enrolled into this trial, about a third of patients had undergone previous resection and failed. A third of patients were uh, had gotten a vagus nerve stimulator and failed. Many of them had undergone intracranial monitoring multiple times, um, and the the in in general, we find that the rate of SUDEP in these cohort of patients is about 9.3 per thousand. And in the RNS trials uh, up to about eight years now, we see that that rate is at 2.3 uh, per thousand. So uh, looks like this is definitely uh, better than the uh, 
patients with intractable epilepsy randomized, but um, statistically the confidence intervals still overlap a little bit for the others. Um, then looking at uh, just the mesial temporal lobe cohort. So again, this is about half the patients that were implanted. Uh, we basically looked at trying to figure out how quickly can we tell whether or not somebody's seizures are coming from one side or both sides. And this has some relevance to how we do intracranial monitoring. Typically, we bring patients into the EMU with depth electrodes in place for one or two weeks, and we try to make a decision about whether they have unilateral epilepsy or bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy. And frequently, we make these decisions after one week of monitoring. Um, and But we've now had an opportunity to look at, at patients with very long-term chronic ambulatory monitoring of their epilepsy. And this patient kind of shows what we found. And you can see that about half of the patients have demonstrated um, a bilateral uh, or contralateral seizure uh, within about two to three weeks. But that means that fully half of the patients by week three still have not demonstrated a seizure coming from the contralateral side. So it's clear that we're probably missing some bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy patients if we only monitor people for uh, up to two weeks. Uh, they've also looked at um, whether or not the RNS can be used as kind of a precursor to uh, seizure surgery. So uh, there's a thought that maybe, you know, like you see here, you can use the RNS to help decide whether somebody has unilateral or bilateral epilepsy. If, in fact, you thought they had bilateral, and then you demonstrate with the NeuroPACE device over a number of years that, that you know, the predominance of seizures are all coming from one side, particularly if it's the non-dominant side, you might decide to take them back for a section if you think you can get them seizure free. And there are a couple of um, uh, papers now demonstrating um, centers that have done just that. Uh, here you can see the first one uh, is uh, four patients who uh, were not, uh, I don't think they were mesial temporal lobe, and then uh, this patient here uh, was mesial temporal lobe and was seizure free, I think for a year after resection. Uh, we also here at Swedish have four patients whom we initially placed the device in and then subsequently went on to a resection. Um, obviously, the device has failed to control their seizures if we're going to go on to do that. But, you know, for uh, this patient here, you know, he did not want to lose. We'd already localized the seizures to visual cortex, wanted to preserve vision, tried to use NeuroPACE. Didn't work after seven years, we brought him back for a section and now he's seizure free. Similarly, we did one with uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. One of them with bitemporal epilepsy uh, is now seizure free. Um, the other one is still not seizure free, but we knew she had very, very bad bitemporal epilepsy from the beginning. Um, then this is also just looking at neocortical uh, epilepsy with the RNS. Uh, this is a cohort uh, of, again, about 50% of the patients that were implanted. And this is just to show that the responder rate um, is fairly similar across the different areas of the brain. Uh, the temporal neocortical does a little bit better than frontal or multilobar, but the, the responder rate is in the order of the 60% range. Um, and then they, we just didn't have a whole lot of parietal and occipital patients to make a lot of meaningful um, statements about it. In terms of safety, it's very comparable to the DBS literature. Uh, there's about a 3.3% chance of infection every time the neurostimulator is either implanted or changed. Uh, we did have some intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, Six of those, six out of nine, were related to seizures uh, after the device was implanted where they hit their head. Uh, there were a number of SUDEPs that were in the trial. Um, there was one patient who committed suicide, one with lymphoma, and then two who were defined as, as SUDEPs. Um, and then this is a paper from uh, last year basically looking at the long-term uh, infection rate. There's a lot of uh, hypothesis that if you go back into the scalp over and over and over again, it's not going to heal as well with subsequent surgeries, and the infection rate or um, erosion rate may go up over time. Um, we have not found that at least out to four generator replacements now. 
And then uh, lastly, for the outcome data, uh, we have now have an eight-year outcome that was just presented in a poster at AES last year. And again, there's about a 66% uh, responder rate with um, about a 66. If you do a last observation carried forward analysis, which is a good way of kind of not being biased by people that are dropping out of the trial, we still get about a 66% mean reduction in their seizure frequency as well. So um, just kind of looking at how we evaluate patients with epilepsy today, it used to be that really you had either resection or the vagus nerve stimulator. And you kind of, you know, if you just look at a risk versus effectiveness graph, you can see that VNS was really a palliative procedure, but it was fairly safe to do, whereas resection um, had the best likelihood of a seizure-free outcome, but the risk was also much higher with that. Today, we have a, a much more kind of nuanced environment, which is good for our patients, but it makes it more confusing for epilepsy centers to, to, to decide what to do. Um, here, I like to break things down into both the surgical risk and the functional risk. You know, again, uh, VNS has a little bit of a surgical risk, very little functional risk. RNS has a little bit more surgical risk, but very low functional risk as well. Uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy, you know, we are going up in the effectiveness scale as we're doing this, uh, but you also have surgical risk of infection and particularly bleeding, visual uh, problems, uh, but relatively little uh, risk to uh, functional status. And again, resection is kind of uh, both the most effective and the most risky, both surgically and functionally. So that's it.